Hi there, this is Mark Haddad here again. So in this lecture, I have to give you the theoretical part behind the dot one X. So what is 802.1X or what we normally call it dot one X? We know that when we are connected to our network, we connect, for example, now we were speaking wired huh? so from a cable, we connect from the computer to the switch and then we can go to the network and also we can get internet service. All right, very good. So let's imagine that here after this switch, there is a an access point, wireless access point, and this one have internet. So the internet is being provided via a wireless access point. So then this guy can go to the internet. Now, what if someone who is not a disciplined employee bring with him an access point, right? So he bring an access point and he connect it to the switch. So remember that we do have here a router, which is giving internet via wireless, but also giving the internet to the wired users. So that means this PC normally has internet, right? So what if we, or this guy, bring this uh, access point and then he connected to the switch, then this access point has internet, he's propagating to everyone the internet, then other employees are connected to that wireless, then this user, which is over here, he is trying to do some type of attacks like man in the middle so he can capture all the traffics that those users are doing and he can see their, for example, passwords, the credit card credentials and so forth. So this is what we call it a rug access point, which is an access point that someone has just brought it and put it in the network and then he has started providing the internet service and then people get authenticating via him. And then, yeah, he has all the access to all the traffic because everything is passing via him now. So do we have a solution here? Because we don't want that anyone who brings a, an access point with him or any other type of hardware, then he can connect to our network. We only want that uh, the users who should be in our network to be connected. So here comes the 802.1x. So that's really the main idea of the 802.1x protocol. All right, so let's now understand how this protocol works. So the A.2.1x consists of three acronyms. There are the supplicant, the authenticator, and the authentication server. So the supplicant is normally the end user. So once uh, we have, for example, a computer connected to the network, that's what we call it the supplicant. The authenticator is normally the switch. So for example, this guy wants to connect to the network. Then he put his cable over here. Does it mean that this port, which is on the switch, will go directly on? Because we have 802.1x enabled here, then the authenticator will not allow this computer to come in before this computer sends some credentials to the authenticator. Now, the supplicants will send the credentials. So we see in this course what uh, different types of credentials we can uh, use. So he sent the credential to the authenticator, which is the switch, but the authenticator will not authenticate him also. He will have to send those information to the authentication server. So then the authentication server has the database over here and he can see that, okay, this user or this computer who wants to join to the network, is he allowed or not? Then if he is allowed, then this authentication server will say to the authenticator, yeah, he's, he can join. Then this authenticator will open for him this port and then this guy can join the network. So very important to remember those acronyms, supplicant, authenticator, and authentication server. So now for authentication server, there are different servers that you can use. The most known one is called radius server. So on radio server, you have different types on the market. There are plenty of radio server, but if you want some radio server, which is free of charge, you can get the uh, free radius. So that's, that's uh, some uh, radio server that you can uh, get it free of charge, but there are different type of radio servers. I'm not gonna say what are those radio servers here. The, otherwise I will be doing marketing for them, but there are a lot of companies having radio servers. Now, Microtech, they have the user manager. User manager is a radius server. So we can use, and in this course, I'm going to show you how you can use the user manager to be the authentication server. And we will see that we will apply that on the lab and then it works. So you have radius server plenty in the market. You can choose the one which works best for you. 
most of them they have you have to pay for using them and you have to have some subscription and you can use them now how the authentications happen we will see that there are different uh, ways to do the authentications it could be that uh, you, you create username and password then this applicant has to put username and password so it can be authenticated by the authentication server it could be the mac address of this supplicant the mac address of the network interface card that's possible there are also more advanced that to be like a certificate then also that's possible but now all right we understand that we have the supplicant we have the authenticator we have the authentication server and we understand how the 802.1x works but let's dig more inside to see how this happens so the traffic or the messages that are being sent inside the 802.1x how this would work so we said that uh, you have uh, one computer who plugged inside the port of the switch. So directly now, the switch port over here, you see that he doesn't allow the DHCP, he doesn't allow the HTTP, he doesn't allow anything which is normal traffic. The only thing that he allows it is what we call it the EAPOL. EIPOL, I just wrote it here to, so you can read it. EIPOL is an extensible authentication protocol over LAN which provide a secure method to send identifying information for network authentication. So using this EAPOL, the computer can send some information, which is information that the authentication server needs to be able to authenticate him, and it is sent in a secure way. That's what's the only thing that is allowed on the switch once we are using 802.1x. So how this can happen, it provides an encrypted EAP tunnel. So you will see that there will be a tunnel, which is EAP tunnel, to prevent outside user from intercepting information. So that means this one is a very secure information. So that means that uh, the mechanism to send the, the information, because anyway, we are sending some credentials, and those credentials should not be seen on uh, the network. So there will be like a tunnel to send all this information and those information will not be seen. Now, after this has happened and uh, the communication happens with the authentication server and he say that, okay, he is authenticated, then you can see directly that the port will go on. If the authentication has been successed, then in this case, the switch port will go green. That means it's open. And then over here, you, the user can start using any IP traffic I put just here example DHCP and HTTP, but it can be any IP traffic. So this is how the 802.1x works. But yeah, what are those messages that are happening in the background to allow the dot one X to work? So uh, we need to get more information about that. Of course, you don't have to because for us as network engineers, we don't really care too much of how the protocol thinks and work. We only need to understand like what we have understood up to now to be able to apply this on uh, configuration. But for me, I would like to go one step further and explain to you a little bit more of how this communication happens between the supplicant, the authenticator and the authentication server. And then by that we have all the uh, uh, global uh, uh, idea about uh, the 802.1x, then we can start doing the labs. So we have to go one more step deeper. So here I have uh, taken this from the uh, Wikipedia and I have seen it that that's really the uh, best place to where they explained about 802.1x. So I have copied it and here is the link that I'm going to leave it for you. So uh, you can also read it yourself. So how the mechanism works on the background? I will take out my video because you have to see behind me the screen. So we said that we have the supplicant, we have the authenticator, and we have the authentication server. So let's see what happens once a computer is trying to connect to our network. So here is the sequence. First starts the initialization. So on detection of a new supplicant. So once this authenticator detects that there is a new supplicant, the port of the switch, which is the authenticator, is enabled and set to unauthorized state. Unauthorized state means that, okay, I see that someone is there, but I'm not allowing anyone to come in. So let me just put the video. It's better for you to see me. All right, so I'm not allowed to anyone to come in and send traffic, but it is, I, I'm detecting that someone is trying to go to the network. 
Then in this state, only 802.1x traffic is allowed. So remember, only the 802.1x is allowed, the traffic which is the EAPOL. Other traffic such as the internet protocol IP, TCP, UDP, whatever is dropped. All right, so that's something we already know about. That's what happens here on the new connection. And that's what we call it initialization. Now, step number two, to initiate the authentication, the authenticator will periodically transmit EAP request identity frame to a special layer two address, which is this address on the local uh, the network segment. So every now and then the authenticator send this one, which is the EAP request identity. Sorry if the, the letters are a bit small, but I just copy it from the Wikipedia. So they always send this to the network. Now, the supplicant, which is the computer, listen on this address, which is the address that he sent it, layer 2, which is this MAC address. And on receipt, so once he receives it, it responds with an EIP response identity frame containing identifier for the supplicant, such as user ID. So, we say that the authenticator is sending always the EIP request identity. Once the supplicant receives it, he will send back this is what you see it here, EAP response identity. And with this EAP response identity, he put the user ID here, they mention it. Then what happens? The authenticator then encapsulate this identity response in a radius access uh, request packet and forward it to the authentic authentication server. So what's going to happen over here? Now I have to move again my video. So once the authenticator received the EAP response identity, then what he does, he just encapsulated and send it to the radius under what we call it the radius access request. Okay, let's continue now to see what's going to happen. Now, uh, here they say also that the supplicant may also initiate or restart authentication by sending EAPOL start frame to authenticator, which then reply with an EAP request identity frame. So that means what? That means that in case, for example, the supplicant does not want to wait for the EAP request identity, which is sent by the authenticator, then he can initiate or restart the authentication by sending himself what is called EAPPOL start frame to the authenticator, then the authenticator will send uh, to him the uh, request identity frame. All right, so we are now up to this level. So he has received the authentication server. He has received the uh, information uh, about uh, the supplicant. Now we have to see what the authentication server will do. So the third step is, we call it negotiation. So this is technically EAP negotiation. The authentication server, once he received the uh, radius uh, access request, then uh, he sent a reply encapsulated in uh, radius access channels packets to the authenticator. So he has received that one. Then he will send now this request or radius access challenge to the authenticator, to the switch. And this will contain the EAP request specifying the EAP method. So uh, th that means the type of EAP-based authentication at which the supplicant to perform. What does it mean here? That means that the authentication server, he will say, okay, I'm using EAP TLS or EAP MS CHAP or whatever. So the type of EAP that the radio server is using, he will say that, that this is what I'm using. I'm waiting for the uh, supplicant to authenticate himself based on this type that I am uh, using to be able to check if it's going to work. Because on EIP, there are different types that you can use, something we can check it when we do uh, the labs. Now, the authenticator in this case will uh, encapsulate the EIP request in a EAPOL frame and transmit it to the sub, uh, supplicant. So then, in this case, the uh, authenticator, which is, which is the switch, will send this to the supplicant. At this point, the supplicant can start uh, using the request EAP method uh, or to do a NAC, which is negative acknowledge and respond with an EAP method that it's willing to perform. So what does it mean here? Once the switch sent for the supplicant, he said that, all right, this is the EAP method that you have to use. This is what the uh, authentication server is asking for. Then the supplicant can have two options, or he say, okay, I'm going to use this uh, EIP uh, type the authentication server is using, or he can say, no, I'm not, I don't want that type, I'm, I want to use that 
other type, then he have to mention which type he has to use. Now, finally, the third step is the authentication. If the authentication server and supplicant agree on the EAP method, so they have to agree on the EAP method, then the EAP request and response are sent between the supplicant and the authentication server. So once they agree about the EAP method, they say, okay, that's the uh, method we are going to use. Then they will start sending the EAP request and response. Of course, they don't send it directly to each other. That's the always you have the authenticator, which is in the middle. Then, until the authentication server responds with the uh, with either an EAP success message or EAP failure. So EAP success message, it is sent by what is called Radius Access Accept. Uh, so you can see that this is, he's saying that this is sent from here, saying that, okay, that's a success uh, authentication that is happening. It comes to the uh, uh, authenticator, which is the switch, and the switch will also confirm it back to the... Uh, uh, supplicant. All right. If it's a failure, then you will get this radius access reject packet. If authentication is successful, then the authenticator set the port to authorize. So now the port will be authorized on uh, the uh, switch and the normal traffic is allowed. If unsuccessful, the port remain in unauthorized state. So that means only uh, the EAPOL is allowed and any other traffic are not allowed. When the supplicant now logs off, so let's say that the supplicant has been authorized, he is uh, authenticated, he can use the network. Now, once the supplicant logs off, so that means that he just shut down the computer or log off from, uh, from the, uh, from the network, whatever, then it will send what's called the EAP or L log off message to the authenticator, which is the switch. And the authenticator then set the port to the unauthorized state once, uh, again, blocking all non EAP traffic. So this is really the mechanism that happens in the background. I understand that you may see it like, okay, do I really need to know all of those? So I would say not really, <laughs> you don't have to, but it's also nice that you understand how this happens. So you can see that everything is coming from supplicant, authenticator, authenticator, authentication server, but also it's coming like this, authentication server to authenticator, authenticator to supplicants. So this is all what I wanted to explain in this uh, first lecture about uh, the uh, dot one uh, X. Uh, that, so all the theoretical part that uh, you need to know. Now, in the upcoming lecture, I have to start uh, doing the labs. I'm going to use the Microtech Router OS version 7 because I need to use the user manager to be my radius server. And believe it or not, the user manager on version 7, you can uh, use it uh, to do the dot one X and it works perfectly. So this is all what I wanted to show you in this lecture. I hope it was informative for you and I'll see you in the upcoming lecture.